Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our PIARC webinar on the COVID-19 crisis and how road authorities and road organizations can respond. My name is Patrick Malejak. I am the Secretary, Secretary General apologies, uh, of the association. Uh, first of all, if you want to ask a question, raise an issue or discuss, share a practice, for example, this is really welcome. You are invited not to speak, and you are invited to use the chat feature of Zoom. Usually, that's at the bottom right of the main window. Please send a message to all participants, which is one of the options. And of course, focus on questions that are specific to roads or road transport. This channel is monitored by our colleague Christos Xenophontos, who is chair of one of our PR committees. Christos will note the questions and he will raise them to relevant panelists during the Q&A part of our webinar today. Your microphone and your camera should be turned off. This is in order to make the webinar more relatable by everyone. At the end of the session today, nevertheless, I will invite all of us to turn the camera back on so that we can take a group picture if you want. So please keep your microphone and camera turned off and use the chat feature to ask questions. The, que the session is being recorded and the video will be shared on PR.org, our website, along with all the other videos from previous webinars. We will also share the PowerPoint slides as PDF files in English, as well as French and Spanish after an automated translation. Disclaimer now, uh, the crisis is ongoing and it's urgent to act. So it's likely that knowledge and practice that will be shared today has not been officially approved by each country's official authorities. Please keep that in mind. Uh, we wouldn't want you to run into trouble, but if you use our recommendations or practice from one country to the other. Nevertheless, we believe that ideas can, and examples shared here can be found interesting in any part of the world. It's really up to you to use that information as you see fit. The key concept is that we focus on the short term. Every day counts. We want to share knowledge and current practice between PR members urgently in order to help you develop the best responses to the pandemic in near real time. Such knowledge and practice are not yet confirmed as valid or effective, and what works in some parts of the world may or may not be relevant elsewhere. Inspiration can be found anywhere, and a good idea now could help you save lives, improve your business resilience, and could help you minimize disruption of services. In parallel, at PIARC, we are planning medium and long-term actions for when the pandemic is in a more manageable state and substantially under control. We have set up a response team, as you can see, it's quite compact, made up of members, chairs, and secretaries of some of our PIARC committees. You will have their email addresses at the end of the presentation. I'm very thankful to all my colleagues for having joining me and for continuing the work, actually, in order to support our members and the rural community worldwide. The agenda structure of our session today, I will guide you through what PIAC is and uh, through the issues that we have structured, uh, because they are the ones that are faced by road operators and administrations. Then we will have four in-depth presentations on the current situation. Uh, the impact on freight, that's the analysis of a French motorway company, road network operation measures in Portugal, the response of the road authority in Uganda, and financing and procurement procedures in emergency and non-emergency cases. This will be followed by a Q&A session moderated by Christos Xenophontos, and then the conclusion. I expect the session to last about an hour and 45 minutes. Our speakers today are myself, the Secretary General of PIARC, Olivier Quoi from Atlande in France, who is a member of our PIAR Committee on Freight. Ricardo Tiago from the Institute for Mobility and Transport in Portugal, who is a member of our Committee on Road Corporations and ITS. Mark Ruparanzia, 
uh, from the National Road Authority in Uganda, who is a member of our Committee on Climate Change and Resilience of Road Networks, and Francesco Longo from ANAS in Italy, who is a member of our Committee on Finance and Procurement. Thanks again to our colleagues for having made themselves available and for having devoted quite some time uh, to preparing very interesting presentations. So as an introduction, I would like to share with you some information about what is PIARC. Uh, so it's the new name of the World Road Association. We have founded 110 years ago, or more than that actually, as a non-profit, non-political association. Our goal is to organize exchange of knowledge on all matters related to roads and road transport. We have four key missions to provide a forum for analysis and discussion of all those topics. This is what we're doing today, actually. We want to disseminate best practice and to give better access to international, international information. We do that through reports or various knowledge products, such as online manuals. We intend to consider the needs of what is sometimes called developing countries and countries in transition, or more accurately, low and middle income countries in our activities. We do that by involving experts from those countries, by organizing seminars in those countries locally, and by asking them what are the topics that they want PR to work on. The fourth mission is to promote uh, and design tools for decision making. I could mention HDM4, that so, um, some of you are familiar with, or CURAM, which is a tool that helps road authorities deal with the transport of dangerous goods in tunnels. How do we do that? Well, we mobilize the expertise of our experts. We do not have a team of experts at our headquarters. What we do is we have experts all over the world. We saw, you saw a few of them uh, earlier on in our response team. We currently have about 1,000 experts from all over the world in more than 20 committee. And those operations, th th this work is guided by a four-year strategic plan, which you can find from our website. So what are the issues? faced by road operators and administrations. They are actually quite varied and we have tried to structure them around six key broad issues. The first one is that you need to ensure your employees health and safety in general as well as in this particular situation. What about toll booth operators for example? What about workers who work from home? What about uh, your staff members who are, who are in maybe critical uh, situations? Or who are critically regularly sick. Issue number two is you need to maintain activity and business continuity. Even though you have fewer workers available sometimes, and even though transport demand might be declining. This is issue number three. The COVID crisis has a strong impact on transport and transportation. You will see that uh, today um, in some of our cases. Uh, road traffic uh, has sharply declined in some countries. But nevertheless, you need to ensure that roads are open, that roads are safe to drive on, and you need to face declining revenues uh, because toll revenues are declining and uh, oil taxes are declining as well. Issue number four and five are business relations and customer and stakeholder relations. You want to make sure that your, your contractors and providers are still operational and are able to deliver you you with services and with goods and materials. You want to take particular care of small and medium uh, sized enterprises. And you want to make sure that you exercise all provisions of your contracts properly and vice versa, in particular in the case of complex contracts such as concession uh, agreements. Issue number six is security. Uh, we are all working from home, home now, not all, but many people are working from home. Some people have taken on jobs that they were not really familiar with in the face of the crisis. IT systems are fragile. There's a sharp increase in cyber attacks and this needs to be dealt with. Uh, those issues were presented in more detail in our, during our previous webinars and I invite you to refer to uh, the minutes of those webinars. This leads us to our first presentation by Olivier Quoi from France. Olivier, when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Très bien, on t'entend. Okay, fine. So uh, I'm uh, very honored and happy to be with you uh, today. 
and uh, I will try to uh, uh, draw the picture of uh, what is happening in France and especially focusing on freight and uh, truck drivers. So we can go to the next. Uh, so my name is Olivier Quoi. Uh, I'm the chief executive officer of Atlanta, uh, which is a French motorway company uh, running about 100 kilometers in the southwest part of France on the A63, which is the main link between uh, France and Spain and Portugal. And uh, so as we will see, it's an international link, uh, quite strategic in Europe. Um, I've been chief executive of Atland uh, since 2015, and I was formerly working for the French Ministry of Transport. And uh, as Patrick said before, I'm, I have joined PIARC in January, being a member of the TC 2.3 on freight, and I'll be uh, the working group leader on uh, overloading and other issues. I'm married with three children and uh, actually working at home, as uh, quite uh, a lot of uh, you uh, must be at the moment. So we can go to uh, the location of uh, our concession. So as I uh, was uh, telling you, linking uh, Spain and Portugal to the rest of Europe, uh, which is a strategic link, and uh, with a long running focus on freight, which expressed himself on uh, organizing some events uh, under the uh, He Works, I Care uh, motto in uh, 2018 and 2019, which is an initiative which originated first on safety issues, uh, being uh, quite upset by trucks, for instance, uh, accidents with our patrol uh, vehicles. And in these uh, events, the idea was to bring together uh, truck drivers and motorway employees. And of course, in the understanding, he works uh, was uh, designing our employee and the eye care was the truck driver. So uh, the intent was to commit uh, truck drivers to security and road safety, uh, taking care of uh, our agent. We can switch to the next. So uh, the impact on traffic is uh, quite huge, uh, as uh, probably most of you uh, have uh, observed too. So you have the pictures of uh, before on the left-hand side and after on the right-hand side. Um, as you can see, we still have trucks, of course, since the A63 is a very important economic link. Uh, but if you look at the curves, uh, the dotted lines uh, are showing the expected values and the uh, continuous ones are showing the actual uh, values. So in green, the light vehicles and in red, the heavy goods vehicle. So we have lost about 90% in light vehicle traffic and for trucks, it's about minus 40, minus 45%. So that's the, the situation, the impact on truck companies are quite uh, very, uh, very different uh, according to uh, the situation of the companies. Of course, all uh, transport which is linked to food or medical is considered as essential, so uh, has been maintained, uh, but quite uh, a lot of other companies have absolutely no truck running uh, for other kind of, uh, of transport. The main difficulty uh, in terms of uh, business model is also for truck company to find freight for comeback trips so that you have more empty trips, uh, which normally would lead to price raise, uh, but which is quite difficult in the current situation uh, since the, the shipper are also in difficult situation. And uh, on April the 10th, so last week, uh, a guide of good practices was published by the main uh, truck uh, organizations uh, to uh, share um, what can be done uh, to ensure a, a good uh, drive and uh, a good working of uh, transport companies. Uh, what has been done at national level and on local level? So uh, no more driving restriction on Sundays. So the states and the government uh, had changed the regulation 
uh, before uh, quite a lot of uh, traffic was forbidden and was banned on some days and now it's uh, open. Uh, some services are still banned, for instance, uh, for moving uh, when uh, people are changing uh, their location, their house. Uh, of course, uh, all service stations are open uh, for fuel services. And uh, on the other side, uh, restaurants are closed uh, and we'll see that uh, shops uh, somehow remain open, uh, but with uh, specific conditions. One of the main issue is information on service availability and the government uh, updated his national site called uh, Bison Futé, which is usually used for uh, information on congestion, especially while going on holidays, uh, but which is now focusing more on service availability, meaning uh, station, uh, service station, uh, fuel, and also uh, we'll see showers or uh, other facilities. Locally, uh, for A63, we have a long-run partnership with uh, Truck Parking Europe, uh, which is uh, an application, a free application, which gives information on parking availability for trucks, on which we can push some uh, information and also get feedback from drivers, since they can leave some comments or messages. Next. Uh, on site, of course, as you can see on the pictures, which are very recent pictures, uh, our main concerns are driver's health, of course, uh, food for drivers, but hopefully also employees' health and safety. So for, uh, in our case, our O&M is Aegis, uh, with 100 people approximately for the 100 kilometers. Uh, which are working, who are working for maintaining area clean and secure. And also uh, service provider economic sustainability is a key issue uh, since they have lost uh, almost all their turnover. And we have four service stations with also approximately 100 employees. So focusing on food and restaurants, uh, this is a touchy issue because uh, restaurants are closed uh, from governmental uh, guidance. And we as concessionaire or road operator have to balance the need for food from the drivers, but also our service provider sustainability. So in some cases, uh, we have uh, food truck initiatives. So uh, some companies are inviting food trucks to come on rest or service areas and so they can provide uh, food to uh, truck drivers but in some other cases uh, we need to focus on our service stations and try to build with them special offers so that they can still uh, go on and provide uh, services. There have been some other initiatives which are quite interesting like providing cleaning kits, uh, offering free coffee, and also uh, some initiatives about clothes cleaning. So it's quite interesting to see that the care uh, for truck drivers is quite widespread. In our case, when I mentioned the motto, uh, he works, I care, it's quite interesting to see that it's now a bit reversed since now the uh, he works is the truck driver and the one who care is now uh, our employee and us finally. So we have to care for uh, the truck drivers who are working. So if we go to the next and uh, almost last picture about showers and facilities, uh, which are very important for truck drivers. In our case, A63 is quite a recent concession and the rest and service areas are of uh, very recent design. So that it's enabled to have uh, a zoning separating trucks area and light vehicles area. Uh, so that will probably be very interesting in the future uh, also to, to separate uh, populations. And uh, we have already dedicated facilities for truck drivers with approximately five showers with hot water uh, in each uh, rest area. And for the future, of course, we are considering enhancement of these facilities with probably the need for hard fixed uh, dispensers for soap or hydroalcoholic solution. So that, that will probably be uh, subject to discussion. 
And last, of course, uh, frequent patrols, which are now more focusing on the rest area cleaning than on accidents, because of course, due to uh, the drop in traffic, we have far less accidents, hopefully. Uh, and so uh, our employees can more focus, can be more focused on the, the cleaning and sanitizing of the, the area. And we also uh, display uh, the last cleaning time, uh, this being uh, quite an also important information for, for the user and for truck drivers. And last, uh, of course, we are a, a toll motorway. So uh, tolling uh, can be a, an issue, uh, and which has been uh, quite largely uh, discussed. Uh, in our case, um, it is not the main, uh, the main topic because uh, most of the traffic is electronic toll service and almost free flow. Uh, so we have no real cash, uh, cash issue. So uh, hopefully, uh, this is not really uh, an issue, of course, except for revenue, which are, which have dropped. And um, that's the, the end of, uh, of my presentation. So thanks. And uh, I'll be available for your questions at, at the end. Thank you, Olivier. That was a very clear, uh, sharp uh, presentation with lots of ideas, actually, and uh, insight. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, please, everyone, don't hesitate and use the chat to ask questions to Olivier or to anyone, actually. So we will move on to our next presentation from Portugal. Ricardo, uh, your turn. Well, very good. Thank you. Okay. So good morning. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with all of PRC uh, members sharing some information on the road network operations taken in Portugal, uh, mainly by Infraestructures Portugal. So my name is Ricardo Tiago. Next slide, please, Patrick. I am a civil, a civil servant. I started working in the, the public office of Estradas Portugal, and now, since 2012, I'm working in Institute for Mobility and Transport as a senior advisor on ITS Mobility, CITS, CICAM mainly. I work in the Department of Managed Contracts and Concessions. And since 2016, I am more focused on the international area, uh, mainly on the European projects. I'm uh, responsible for the Sea Roads Portugal a project with the setup of the national access point in Portugal. And just to highlight, I was a former uh, member of the TC 3.3 uh, road tunnels operations in the last cycle of PRC. And now, as Patrick said, I am a member of the RNO and ITS uh, in, in, this, in this cycle. Next slide, please, Patrick. So IMT, in a nutshell, we are a public institute. We depend of four ministries, mainly on the Ministry of Infrastructures and Housing, but also in the Internal Affairs, the Environment, and C. IMT have, has a broad scope and performs several activities in the transport sector. In terms of ITS, we de define the implementations uh, at the national level and related to the transport infrastructures. We do technical regulation, licensing, coordinating, supervision and planning. We issue driver's license. Well, IMT is uh, a merge of three former institutes on the roads, on the public transport and on the maritime level. So we have uh, a big shoulder to, to support and we have uh, plenty of uh, activities to perform. Next slide, please. And this is not easy, as you can imagine. So in terms of the road operator stakeholders map, as you can see, this is a picture in, with IMT on the top, uh, acting as the, the grantor uh, side, the, the government. And then we have on the right side, the road operators uh, of the private sector. Together they form APCAP. APCAP is the national association, the same as ASECAP and in the European side. And on the left, you have Infrastructures Portugal, a national body, a public institute, and also they have under their umbrella some several uh, subconcessions. So this is more or less the scheme in Portugal. Next slide, please. So this is just some key uh, message regarding the IMT. We have uh, several sectors, and I will highlight only in terms of the management of concession contracts granted by the state we perform, we assess their performance uh, in nationwide. 
So the, we monitoring and assess the management, the management and the operation, uh, not on a daily basis, uh, of course, but we supervise the, the, the performance of the road operators. Next slide, please. So I, IP Infraestructuras Portugal, they are a public company. They more or less manage almost uh, 14,000 kilometers of roads. They have, as you can imagine, uh, plenty of equipments, mainly ITS with cameras, VMS, traffic and weather sensors. So they provide a national level operation. So they perform on a national level. Next slide, please, Patrick. In terms of the private sector, APCAP with its, all its members, they uh, operate more or less uh, 3.6 thousand kilometers. So as you can imagine, they have, they have a quite different objective uh, they perform, of course, uh, but the business in their core activity as uh, Portuguese uh, highways are all told. Uh, and so they have uh, plenty to do all this in this uh, COVID situation, <laughs> but they are, I think they are ready. Some key, uh, some key dates uh, regarding the, the COVID, and I will focus on the 5th of March, IMT Directives Council implemented its contingency plan and it's being updated as, as needed. And on the 13th of March, the, uh, the Portuguese government made a, a decree with several temporary measures regarding COVID. And on the same day, the, the Board of Infrastructures Portugal commit themselves to implement in all their companies, there are several, to an appropriate well, uh, program and plan also to deal with COVID. Some of them were implemented in February 27. So, uh, we, we started our approach on COVID several uh, days before uh, some implementing uh, decreed laws in the government. Next, please. So, uh, some highlights on the legislation in Portugal. Uh, we have a temporary re reintroduction of border control between Portugal and Spain, as a colleague already mentioned. And just to highlight that, we uh, fulfill the European Commission uh, message to the member states and in order to set up the, the green line then in our nine borders we have seven that are green line green lanes and you can see on that uh, source in this website uh, IMT also published more information regarding service and rest areas and uh, inspection vehicle centers so I would advise if you want to look a little bit more in the situation of transport and mobility sector in Portugal to follow up that, that that link next please so we, as in many of the countries, we are, we are in a state of emergency. So uh, the first state of emergency was set up in 18 of March. Well, the only time Portugal had a state of emergency was in 1975 during the revolution. So it was a big shift in, in, in our way of life and way of mobility in terms of in the cities and both in national. Several measures was, were implemented. And this is just some, I will not read, you can check it out later. Uh, we have plenty of legislation around COVID, uh, around many sectors, and with a special uh, information to the people is stay at home, a mandatory stay uh, at home order, and a special duty of protection when, if needed, to go outside your houses. Next, please. So just uh, a highlight that all the citizens that need to go uh, in service with, because of their professional life, well, they have to have a declaration signed by its, uh, its uh, company. This is a copy of mine. And just to highlight that I am a part of uh, an emergency service in IMT. So my declaration states that I can travel uh, nationwide if there is anything on the network needs uh, supervision of IMT. Next, please, Patrick. So just uh, as a, a resume, this is uh, the decrees that have been set up in Portugal. We are in, on the third phase of the emergency state. And uh, by now, uh, in this last one, we are already thinking about some measures towards the restart phase. What can be, uh, what are the companies that can be open? So in this, in this 15 days that we are dealing, the government is setting up a plan to reopen some, some, some things in order to economy start uh, to open and uh, to highlight that uh, it's needed also in terms of health and safety that the economy is on uh, the same basis. Uh, we are on the restart phase at this moment in Portugal and we are very uh, confident that we will achieve some good measures. Next please. So more in terms of the National Road Administration. Well, 
there were some rules, as I explained, and these rules, uh, how can we supervise and how can we implement? So in one hand, people need to stay at home, uh, but they can go outside, perform their professional activities. And this needs some cooperation between all of us. So we need to work hand in hand in order to make, uh, to make us aware of the health and safety issues. Next, please. So uh, the government wanted to pass information on the importance of limiting travel during this period. So we set up a national campaign on VMS. The message was clearly to stay at home. Uh, and of course, this was uh, issued around the VMS on the, the cars uh, during, during their mainly operation. Well, the picture in the, in the center side was taken uh, uh, in this year, so Portugal has some, some mountains and we have already a couple of periods of snow. And of course, the, the traffic control centers are up and running 24 by 7 and uh, to see what's happening on the road. Infraestructures Portugal, as a main uh, national operator, is focused on the mobility and safety of all the ones who are on their road and are on their uh, jobs. Next, please. So what and in this in this slides, what I would like to highlight, well, regarding the VMS uh, that most many of the countries have, we already uh, implemented a, an ITS low cost solution that was sent out the message to everyone's mobile phones. We have uh, we have cooperation with the telecom operators. This was done in the past regarding emergency and protection services around fires. So everyone in Portugal received a message with uh, stay at home advice. It was a very efficient, a very good ITS low cost solution. And it's, I think it's easy to be uh, implemented in so many other countries. The message was well understood uh, in Portugal and the traffic decreased a lot around the network and uh, people are obeying uh, this, this, this issue. Next, please. And some of you already saw some good uh, reports on some international magazines stating that Portugal is a good example at this stage. And uh, some information, uh, Google has issued some reports of many countries and uh, Portugal as well, some in Lisbon and Portugal. This is just a few numbers. Uh, in red is the, the national average. And as you can expect, the traffic and the movement of people are decreasing a lot, but in the residential areas has increased a little bit because we are at home and we uh, leave our homes in, in just a few spaces. Next, please. And I think it's everywhere is the same. So just, uh, just to give you a number, we are more mainly focusing on numbers. Well, Marão Tunnel in the north part of Portugal is one uh, the biggest uh, Europe, uh, Iberian tunnel. And the traffic decreases a lot between the, the, the dates from 26th of February to the last that report that I have is on 5th of April. So almost a 90% uh, decrease in traffic. But still, that 1,460 uh, vehicles that was on the road, the National Guard and the police thought, well, even though the number is uh, low, we still want to have some enforcement activities on the road in that special uh, route. Uh, next slide, please. So they set up uh, the intention to have uh, some points in the network and of course, Infraestructuras Portugal uh, has contributed to that objective and helped the, the, the police to set up some traffic and informants, informants activities. Well, uh, this is run by uh, other road operators in, in close collaboration with the police uh, around the country. So although uh, the message were, were taken. And of course, some priority tasks to be taken during this, this crisis and uh, regarding operation and maintenance. Well, plenty of the works uh, are doing in the road is just the strictly, the strictly ones where need to be carried out because many of us are on telework. I am on telework uh, almost uh, one month and a half. We have, they have performed and implemented their contingency plans with backup mechanisms, rotation of teams in order to avoid uh, the, the contagion. Of course, uh, health cares, and as the colleague uh, said, regarding the, the sanitation and the cleaning activities, well, they need to be upgraded and done on a more regularly basis. Of course, for the ones who are working on the roads with cars, uh, be driven by the teams, they need to be sanitized during uh, 
the shifts. Next, please. And of course, in this in this period, cybersecurity is is a risk because we are using our technologies a lot. This is just some some numbers. And uh, Infrastructure Portugal has more or less 50% of the workers in, in telework. And uh, IMT, since we are not an operational institute, well, uh, that percentage is a little bit higher. 71% of us are working from home. Next, please. So, some actions. IP professionals, uh, Infrastructure Portugal and some other road operators, alongside with the health professionals, are considered essential workers. The, the networks is on. They are the roads are up and running, so the public service needs to be fulfilled to the population. We need to guarantee the mobility for the ones who need it, and uh, decentralization of service is crucial. Uh, not putting all eggs in one basket, and of course, uh, since we are talking about roads, even though the traffic is decreasing a lot, still uh, road operators need to guarantee the circulation and the safety and the operational of the infrastructures so uh, alongside with the contingency plans they need to be uh, ready for the decrease of traffic but although when the traffic is increasing a little bit they need to um, readjust their contingency plans in order to tackle the, the the mobility needs for the people next please so this is just some 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 pictures of them the, the, the critical activities that are all up and running at, as we speak. So, well, the, the, the summer is, is approaching, the, the, the fire season is approaching as well. Portugal has in the past a, a bad experience on that. So this is a critical activity on the road and this is just a picture of that. And of course, uh, some maintenance works and repairs are still need to be done, uh, even though we are in the COVID situation. Next, please. And of course, as I mentioned before, our roads are, are open. There are some cars on the road and unfortunately, accidents still happen and they need to be uh, signalized, protect. And uh, Infrastructure Portugal has the teams ready with the, the safety measures uh, accordingly to the situation and they are performing maintenance, uh, surveillance, operation activities. Next, please. So as Patrick mentioned uh, on the beginning of his presentation, PRC uh, has more or less structured with six key issues and each one of us needs to be doing their own things on a specific topic. But we cannot just do on one topic and leave the others around. So each entity regarding the main focus, even though it's the state, even though it's the road operators, even if it's the police or others, we need to work hand in hand we need to work not with our backsides to each other, not to compete, but to cooperate. And only that we can achieve uh, the benefits of this situation. Next slide, please. So the main message that I would like to, to give to our colleagues is that in Portugal, our road sector, we don't stop. We are still on. We are doing a national response to COVID and in cooperation with all the entities that are on the road mobility sector. Next, please. So I hope you uh, have a clear picture of what is happening on Portugal. Feel free to address me. This is the Portuguese team on the, the road network uh, and ITS uh, technical committee of PR, myself and my colleague Vasco Gonçalves, who I thank a lot for his collaboration in this presentation. And stay safe, stay at home if possible, and thanks PR for the opportunity provided by Portugal. Thank you very much, Ricardo. That was a detailed presentation with lots of ideas. And I think when you mentioned cooperation at PIARC, uh, of course, we could not agree more. Uh, I think now is the time to move on to our next speaker, uh, Mark Obarenzia from Uganda. Mark, uh, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, I'm going to be speaking on the impact and response uh, to COVID-19 in Uganda, uh, specifically from the transport sector, and I will speak from the lens of the Uganda National Road Authority, who are the people responsible for managing the national road network. Next, please. So about me, I'm the head of research and development uh, in uh, the Uganda National Road Authority. I am PIAC's first delegate for Uganda. I'm a committee member on the Committee of Climate Change and Resilience of Road Networks. 
I'm a board member of the International Road Federation Africa Board and Vice President of the Ghana Institution of Professional Engineers. Next. So I'll divide this uh, presentation into six bits. In the beginning, I will give some context on, uh, on uh, UNRWA, and then I'll talk about the official government response to COVID-19 and the uh, economic impact of COVID-19 on Uganda. This is still an official government position. And then the impact on uh, our operations as UNRWA, how we're responding to it, and then I'll propose some questions going forward. Next. So UNRWA was set up in um, 2008 as a semi-autonomous agency of government that is responsible for the management, maintenance, and development of the national road network. Uh, it offers uh, advisory services to government on matters concerning roads and operates under the general supervision of the Minister of Works and Transport. Uh, we conduct our operations through one head office and 23 maintenance stations that are spread all over the country. Uh, what is what is key to this presentation is to note that um, over the last five years, UNRWA has been undertaking a transformation process, which began um, uh, in 2015. And uh, this crisis has actually offered us an opportunity to see some of the benefits of what we have been under undertaking. And I will speak more to that in later slides. Next. So our scope, we manage uh, just under 21,000 kilometers of uh, national roads, strategic road network, of which only 24% is paved. So a whole 76% is unpaved. We're responsible for 12 ferry crossings. We've got um, well over 600 major structures, which are bridges and box coverts. And we've got um, uh, 14 way stations to control uh, vehicle, vehicle overloading across the country. Next. So some of the key initiatives that I told you about in the um, transformation process, uh, one was to improve uh, our governance and uh, stakeholder relations. We've invested in improving our processes and systems, development of staff capacity and equipment, and we have evolved towards a paperless environment. We also established and prioritized uh, research and development. Next. So now let's get the official government response to COVID-19. Now, um, it's worth noting that the first case uh, of COVID-19 was confirmed in Uganda on March 21st, but uh, already a fortnight before, the Ministry of Health had issued guidelines uh, on how we could prevent the importation of COVID-19. And then uh, a few days later, it issued guidelines against mass gatherings. So a day after the first confirmed case was reported, the president closed the international borders. A few days later, public transportation was suspended. And still a few days later, the nation went into a complete lockdown. This was for two weeks. And uh, on the 14th of, of April, which was two weeks later, the lockdown was extended for a further 21 days, and it's due to, to end on the 5th of May. So as of uh, the 19th of April, um, the president reported that um, the, the curve, our curve is uh, flattening and extending to zero at times. And as of today, there's been um, 61 reported cases, 38 recoveries, and no fatalities. Next. Now, this is a position from the Ministry of uh, Finance, Economic, and uh, um, Economic Development. Um, so it is projected that our economy is going to shrink. Uh, the banking sector is going to face uh, an increasing number of non-performing loans, particularly coming in from the construction sector. Loan disbursements are projected to decline by 50% to the close of this financial year due to likely delays in uh, project execution and disruptions of the supply chain of project inputs. There's likely to be a slowdown in the rate of execution of development projects. And this would especially be in the transport and energy sectors. And this is because of the impact of uh, project financing, as well as likely impact 
on uh, required inputs that have to be imported given that the borders are closed. Um, there is also a risk to private um, financing of PPP projects, and this is likely to delay completion of uh, planned projects. Next. So getting down to UNRWA and how this has impacted on us, it's impacted on us in, in several ways, and I, I will just uh, uh, mention a few. One was staff. This was the highest priority for us, uh, ensuring that uh, our employees were healthy and safe. Our stakeholders, uh, we have ensured uh, we maintain good relationships and uh, keep them well informed of everything. Access to the network, this was also a priority. Uh, the network is uh, continually accessible. We have maintained uh, most of the ferries in operation, and uh, this is because much of the nation is in lockdown. Uh, the road network is still being used for transit, both internal and uh, regional transit. Next. Uh, our project activities are going to have been impacted. I'm going to speak to this a little later. And then in regard to procurement, the agency responsible for procurement uh, issued us some guidelines which we're following. Uh, so bids are now being submitted in soft copy. There was a provision made for extension of, um, of uh, bids. Uh, the pre-bid meetings have all been suspended. And for all procurement related meetings that must still take place, um, re uh, regulations were issued which really ensures that um, there is, um, they do not contravene um, the guidelines issued by the government in, in relation to social distancing. Uh, we expect some uh, impact on financing, but uh, this is it's still too early to say much about that. Next. Uh, so one of the core cool things we did, even before, um, the Ministry of Health had started issuing their guidance is we set up a business continuity management team. And its core roles were first and foremost to ensure the uh, health and well being of our staff, uh, ensure continuity of our business, find a way of balancing our operations with the government directives that had started to come in, and then also coordinate the uh, corporate social responsibility response. Um, by the organization and staff of the organization towards the, the national COVID-19 response. In terms of staff matters, uh, key to, to look after were the staff who are in office, and particularly those dealing with our customers, and then the staff in the field. So there's been uh, early and frequent updates to all staff. Remote uh, working was advised as soon as the country was locked down and we continue to provide all the necessary uh, things like um, sanitizers, thermometers, and masks to ensure that um, our staff can work safely and, uh, and stay safe. Next. Uh, project activities, uh, essential maintenance activities are still ongoing, although some more routine maintenance uh, in, in certain cases is not uh, taking place. We have taken advantage of the um, relatively clear roads to undertake some studies that are necessary for uh, planning purposes. So we are, we are estimating um, age, uh, aging of certain pieces of road infrastructure to plan for their maintenance and upgrade, upgrading. Uh, it's worth noting that, of course, it, given that expatriates are not able to enter the country, then it's likely having an impact on some of our projects. But that notwithstanding, contractors were tasked to adhere to all uh, government uh, COVID-19 measures and directives. This, uh, this uh, pandemic has given us an opportunity to enhance the use of the technology in which we had invested a lot over the past five years, as well as uh, try out some new uh, pieces of technology that are available. And uh, in regard to financing, we've not had a direct hit because we do not have uh, tolled roads per se. So all our income comes in from development partners and the government of Uganda. So that, of course, might change as uh, we shall discuss uh, a little later in, in the presentation. Next. So uh, 
some some thoughts for us as well as for all all of you who are listening. First is uh, what are the future financing priorities going to look like? Uh, in our case, we know that uh, the government of uh, of Uganda is having to uh, redirect a lot of resources to um, fight the pandemic. So what's the likely impact on our government releases? Is it going to affect our budget? Is it not? Uh, our development partners, we know that uh, in the respective countries, you're also having to divert a lot of resources. So is that going to have an impact on the amount of uh, support flowing in or, or, or will it not? So these are questions that uh, we're beginning to reflect on. Uh, we have changed our work methods. So how is that going to affect uh, productivity? This is, this is something that has not been uh, trialed. It's not been planned per se. And uh, one of the key considerations here would be the asset value. Because if we are going to have any changes to do with say, the maintenance activities and all these other processes we do, how are we going to preserve the asset value? Or is it going to have a longer term effect? Uh, cyber security is something that um, keeps our IT team awake all night. And how long will the lockdown last? Because the longer it lasts, the more irrelevant it is likely to make our existing strategy, given that we're not able to execute it. And will we get to a point where we then need to just come up with a new strategy? So these are questions that we're pondering, and these are questions that I'd like to leave you with uh, as we enter the the next session, which is questions and answers. So thank you for your attention and over to you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Mark. It was a very, very interesting presentation and I'm glad you could uh, take the time from Uganda to join us in this webinar. And as you said, uh, this is for the audience. If you have any question or remark or ID that you would like to share with Mark and with the other panelists, please use the chat channel in Zoom and this is monitored by Christos, and he will direct the questions to the panelists during the Q&A later in uh, the webinar today. Thank you again, Mark. Thank you. Our next presenter and fourth panelist for today is Francesco Longo from Italy. Francesco, your turn. Thank you. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, very well, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. So the presentation is about financing and procurement procedures in emergency and non-emergency cases. So to, to learn which are the main elements of emergency procedures that we can use in normal, in non-emergency cases. So next slide, please. A short presentation. I'm working ANAS, that's the the major uh, public contracting authority in uh, uh, in Italy, and manage uh, thirty thousand um, uh, kilometers of uh, freeways. Uh, I'm international finance manager, structuring leader for PPP um, investments throughout uh, in Italy, and uh, I'm in the exterior. Uh, so I'm a member of uh, 1.3 Technical Committee uh, International and the homologue in Italy. Next slide. So we'll go to, um, to analyze what are the, the normal procedures and, uh, and then the emergency procedures to make any limits and solution to make an intermediate procedures that can be used in normal situations. Next slide, please. Uh, these, these are the, the normal procedures that ANAS and uh, uh, in Italy, but um, in, in most of uh, countries all over the world that are used. So the open procedure, uh, that's the classic procedure, the restrictive procedure that um, where only was being pre-selected would be able to, to participate. Then the competitive negotiated procedure where that is uh, send the, the restrictive procedure but uh, uh, this can use in uh, well uh, in, in time where the, the the product is not being defined. 
the competitive dialogue that is a, a procedure when, uh, when the, the contracting the authority needs a, a, a new solution for a real problem. The innovation partnership, that's the normal procedure when can be used when the, the need of a good of, or a service uh, doesn't yet exist in the market. And then the design competition, uh, that is only a, a proposal for ideas. Next slide, please. Here we, um, the, um, uh, I go to, to present uh, an overview of emergency procedures in Italy with two cases. Uh, generally, the, the, procedure, uh, the, um, the emergency procedures uh, uh, give more, uh, more power to the government, in particular to the, the, to the President of Council of Ministers to implement interventions uh, related with the emergency and to avoid dangerous situation of greater damage for people and things. Um, obviously, uh, this condition is strictly related with the emergency, it's temporary, is uh, uh, is uh, and uh, another characteristic is that uh, must be uh, impossibly to of proceeding with ordinary tools. Next slide. This is a, a, a brief presentation of the the um, decree that uh, government uh, um, uh, turned with uh, the COVID nineteen. Uh, where uh, the, obviously the major attention is given to to healthy sector, to healthy um, uh, national service, but uh, it functions for all other supplies that can be related with national with uh, national uh, healthy services. Uh, the the main elements of this decree is that. Uh, the government can set deadlines for the secret guests uh, to participate and, uh, and, uh, and reduce the orders. Then the, to simplify the publication of tender. And then the, the third, that is more important and more dangerous to, to apply in uh, normal situations is the the, the possibility to for um, participants to declare with self certification the possession of uh, of the requirements that are um, uh, necessary for for the supply. Next slide, please. This is another uh, another situation that is non an emergency health situation, but is at as you know, uh, the Ponte Morandi emergency. So, as a result of collapse of pressure of uh, the Viadu Polcevera, uh, where there is another example, uh, there the government uh, nominated an extraordinary commissioner for reconstruction uh, according to the European Directive of procurement in particular article uh, article 32 um, where the the extraordinary commissioner has new powers to derogate to norm, uh, to normal law um, negotiating uh, suppliers without prior publications next please so according to this degree, uh, the extraordinary commissioner can have uh, a full power for reconstruction, uh, but uh, for two steps. The, the first step is the, the demolition, removal, and the lifting of the resulting materials of the, the, the collapsed viaduct. And then design, assignment, and reconstruction of the, the new infrastructure. Uh, this they're relegating to 
to the main articles of procure, Italian procurement code for normal situation. So, uh, next slide, please. Uh, obviously, these uh, these uh, uh, emergency procedures are um, uh, many best uh, uh, elements that can can faster the the process, but they have the limits. So, because the the, the question is, why don't you use the emergency procedures in a normal situation? Because they are the um, faster. Uh, the, the principal limits of emergency procedures uh, are uh, the completeness of preliminary analysis, the respect of transparency, the respect for competition, the optimization of resources, and then, uh, but not less important, the, the safeguard of the quality of the products, so the guarantee that the contract will be executed um, normally. Then there are uh, uh, other uh, topics, for example, political commitment and uh, financial solidity of the states. Uh, but uh, another another um, another topic that we are uh, trying in this uh, in this period is. Uh, the, um, the many tools of digital transformation that we are uh, using in this uh, period, uh, I think to um, smart working and then uh, continuation of activities that would be uh, closed for uh, limitation. So to to um, um, to mitigate these limits, so to to try to to find uh, an intermediate procedure between emergency cases and non-emergency cases, um, we structured six uh, uh, steps that can uh, improve it uh, to to prepare an intermediate procedures. Next slide, please. So the idea is to, to, to start a debate to, to find these intermediate procedures. In this uh, moment, in, this, in these uh, days, uh, there are main authorities in Italy that are ANAC, Antitrust uh, Authority, ART, that is uh, the, the authority for regulation of transportation, the CIPE, that is the planning department for um, the government, and obviously ANAS, uh, which is the major public contracting authority, that are studying how to implement uh, uh, some tools to make faster the, the normal steps that, that uh, uh, are part of a structuring process. For example, uh, financing method analysis, that is the analysis uh, for the, the main instruments to be used in these cases. We know that Tomorrow we have the European Council uh, about uh, the financial instruments that the European Union can put on. Uh, tomorrow it's maybe two months after the pandemic declaration. So this activity uh, can, can take off uh, two months before and not two months after then the cost benefit analysis here uh, italian authorities and anas too is, uh, are improving uh, tools and uh, and uh, instruments that can uh, make faster this uh, this process that is uh, a main process that decide if the um, road or the infrastructure are we done or not Next slide. 
financial modeling that is uh, uh, in 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 this case the uh, the main elements that can um, keep faster the the process is the access to the information uh, information of balance of private market information of uh, uh, financial institutions so to automatize to automatize the the, the process of um, modeling then the risk management the risk management as uh, according to international methodologies are uh, an, a, a, a normal process that is identified as seen quantified the the the, the risks um, in and risk matrix if we think COVID-19 is a typical first major uh, risk. So uh, um, uh, this could be uh, affronted uh, in, in different ways if we have a, a, a strong matrix risks that can uh, quantify the first major risks. Um, then the value for money that is the, the instrument that uh, um, which result uh, can uh, suggest to the public authority in which type of tender uh, to 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 go on to to realize the project if with uh, including private capital uh, or with public private partnership scheme or in public authority next slide the the last one uh, mechanism is is the mechanism of guarantees uh, so the classic performance bond operation bond the, the and then the the, the the coverage of risk of uh, ruin or works uh, the insurance uh, for uh, interruptions of ONM period, uh, a guarantee with uh, against um, uh, the ONM obligation. So these uh, six uh, steps um, now are very slow, uh, but. Um, uh, all out, all Italian authorities are improving systems to um, make faster these um, these activities. Uh, with the main the main elements are the access to information uh, for um, the analysis of financial methods, financial modeling, cost benefit analysis. So to to reduce tools but to access to the information of private market in particular of financial institutions and uh, uh, not only financial institutions but uh, of uh, um, private competitors too uh, because uh, it, it's happening in Italy in, in, uh, in, in other countries that we see that a, a contractor uh, after the the the, the sign of contract, uh, we see that does not the requirements to to the um, to to go on with the contract. So the the next slide to to resume um, for for this the. Um, the, 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 the possibility to declare uh, with self-certification the possession of requirements is is uh, is um, obsolete in in this period because uh, with the technology we can know uh, uh, financial and uh, legal uh, information of private markets so there are um, there are many many topics that are discussing in Italy um, where we have um, a, a ministry for innovation technology too so um, uh, 
we we hope very well. So thank you and sorry for my English. Thank you very much, Francesco. Uh, and uh, thank you for that general presentation about finance and procurement, but also applicable to the current situation. Uh, those slides, as I said earlier, will be shared uh, on our website afterwards. If you want, uh, dear colleagues in the audience, uh, to refer to them for your future activities. Uh, just for one second now, we will move on to the uh, questions and answers. So Christos, did you notify uh, interesting questions uh, from the audience? Uh, yes, and uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists uh, for uh, being here today and uh, you know, for uh, their excellent uh, presentations. Um, so if, uh, you know, I will start with, um, you know, a question, uh, you know, to Olivia and Ricardo. And um, the first question is relative to the impacts on border crossing for trucks and what are the challenges and solutions that uh, you have been through that you can share with us, please. So, um, Olivia, uh, I'll turn that one first to you and then uh, to Ricardo, please. Patrick, we yeah, need I don't, to. I don't um, see, yeah, I don't see Olivier anymore, so let me check. And uh, maybe oh, Olivier is here, yes. Okay. Yes, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, fine. Yes, I was waiting for the microphone. So, border crossing is a very important issue. Uh, it is right. Um, we are not directly at the Spanish French border, but we are very close to it. Uh, there was real threat uh, mid-March when the lockdown was decided uh, that the border uh, was to be closed. Uh, we had to dispense some VIMS uh, information uh, saying that uh, uh, border uh, will be uh, closed. In the end, it was only for light vehicles, but hopefully not for trucks. Um, but it's true that IDs are circulating. Uh, of course, as it was mentioned, the European Commission asked every country to leave borders open at least for uh, trucks and heavy goods uh, circulation. But of course, uh, we know that there are still questions. Among them, uh, well, it, it's PIAC, so it's really very open and, and my, my uh, what I, I will going to say uh, that involved absolutely nobody, but uh, we heard of uh, IDs like, you know, uh, for semi-trailers, for instance, changing tractors at the border, um, which seems quite very difficult because uh, you would need to find parking places and uh, also find organization with possibly various truck companies. So um, I don't really believe in that. Uh, but it's true also that one of uh, the way that uh, truck companies, but also ourselves, uh, when we are driving our patrol uh, vehicles, uh, one of the good organizations seems to dedicate vehicle to people so that uh, it's uh, easier uh, to manage. Otherwise, of course, you have to clean the vehicles, the, the wheel drive, etc. Uh, and, and sanitize everything. But of course, if you do that uh, in the workforce organization, it's far more difficult. And, um, and that would bring the question at border crossing. The other question or issue is that in our case, if you look at the uh, international traffic uh, that is going through uh, the French-Spanish border, uh, we have less than we'll say less than 40% of the trucks that would be either French, Spanish, or Portuguese. We have quite a lot of others who are coming from uh, and which are driven by uh, German, Polish, Netherlands, or all the other countries. So, well, that, that, that's probably also part of the, um, uh, of the difficulty if we were to split the uh, the trips at at border. So, uh, for the moment, I think the organization is quite fluid, 
um, and uh, I hope it will it will remain like that. And thank you, Olivier. Uh, Ricardo, if I could ask the same question of you, please, relative to border crossings and challenges and solutions. Yes, of course, Christos, thank you. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, yes, thank you. So, as you, as you can see in the, the slide that I have put on the screen, uh, well, in Portugal, Portugal and Spain agreed from the 64, I think, borders that we have in our both countries, only to uh, put up nine. So only nine borders are open. From those nine, only seven are marked as green lanes. And uh, as Olivier mentioned, green lanes are for allowing uh, heavy goods vehicles to, to pass uh, normally. And there are other uh, exceptions to the non possibly possibility to, to cross. Well, workers that live in Portugal, but uh, work in Spain and vice versa, diplomatic uh, people, healthcare uh, workers. Uh, so there are some exceptions. So the borders are up and running, of course, for two reason, uh, reasons, of course, um, no, 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 no passing is allowed. And on those, those seven green lanes, well, we are trying to, to update the, the, that website that I was mentioned to put the waiting times uh, on an official basis. Um, in a non-official basis, more or less, the waiting times is less than 15 minutes. So uh, it's, it's normally uh, the situation. Of course, the traffic has decreased a lot and that helps a little bit on the issue. Uh, concerning the, the challenges is, is like that. Uh, we have less uh, traffic, but we need still to provide some information. And IMT has set up uh, on that website a hub, a COVID hub, alongside with the, the information on the, the border posts that are open. We have also information regarding rest and service areas so that the truck drivers can see on an app on their phone uh, what rest areas are open, what uh, fuel areas are open, what kind of service they have, if they have an hotel, if they have a restaurant, if they have showers. So I think the main challenge at this point, uh, although the traffic is decreasing, there are some traffic on the roads and we need to provide better and better information so that truck drivers can plan uh, their trips for the companies can plan their operational basis. And this is, I think, uh, the, the main focus that we, as a member state, need to, to, to put in place is an information service as updated as can be in order to truck drivers and other professionals that need their roads to work and to keep the economy alive as possible to have uh, that information. Of course, Portugal is in, a, well, it's in a, an advantage solution that we only have one border. Uh, but in other countries that could be a problem a bigger problem uh, as as uh, olivier mentioned uh, there is the truck site, the truck parking uh, website as a european basis that could also be useful to to to, to share and to to improve the information uh, so my main focus at this time is keep the information challenge channels open the cooperation between entities well we need the the uh, internal affairs administration to have with the police and with the, the road operators a close cooperation in order to set up this. Uh, I think more or less is the situation that uh, Olivier uh, has explained and many of the member states are uh, setting up uh, a, web, a web portal uh, to gather this information. I know that Spain has a similar one, France has that one and Portugal has uh, since 14th of April, uh, a special website regarding the COVID information regarding the transport sector. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, I will start the next, the next uh, question with uh, Francisco. And um, relative to the projected revenues and, um, uh, you know, particularly if these uh, revenue shortfalls can be addressed under consens concession contracts, any force uh, majeure situations arise? Francisco? Yes, well, um, in this moment, in uh, the, the Italian regulation uh, reviewed that a part of revenues for contractors 
is devolved to the to the public administration uh, in this moment where uh, um, maybe 87 percent of traffic of decrease uh, this is the in, in, uh, in these months uh, the planning department is starting to to stop this uh, this royalty uh, and so to to refund with other sources um, then uh, obviously um, in Italy, there are uh, 6,000 of kilometers in uh, concession with 25 concessioners that are in, uh, in crisis, obviously, uh, not only for the less of uh, consumers, but uh, for the, for the uh, less uh, the restrictions. Mm, the idea is uh, that it is on the desk in the, uh, now is to um, improve uh, social bond green bonds and uh, uh, other instruments uh, that concessioner can put on uh, guaranteed by the um, the state by the government to refund the necessity um, because obviously in this moment their uh, financial capacity for investment is uh, uh, less and uh, the financial uh, sources has to be um, used to, to restore, uh, to uh, maintain the occupation uh, for other two months. Francisco, we lost you here. So I will, yeah. um, are you back? No, I'm here. Okay, so the follow up to that is whether you will address the loss of revenue uh, uh, due to the lockdown through your insurers or do you see that as purely uh, the business risk uh, on the government? Well, um, uh, in Italy, um, uh, there's no yet uh, a, a, a formal uh, regulation, but in other countries, um, the, the planning authorities are uh, contingencies to mitigate these risks and to coverage these risks uh, before the start of each project uh, where are allocated some contingencies for force majeure um, uh, events. Um, Thank you, Francisco. Um, Olivia, if I could also ask you the uh, same two questions, please. Uh, relative to the effect of the COVID-19 crisis on projected toll revenues and how will these revenue shortfalls be addressed under the concession contracts and if uh, you see force majeure situations arising? Yes, so uh, in our case, uh, insurers do not address the revenue loss in the case of such pandemia. Uh, that's the actual uh, case. Um, secondly, uh, behind force majeure in France, the government uh, allowed um, uh, public contracts to address force majeure, but only uh, regarding um, uh, time and delay. Uh, that means that, for instance, if works cannot be delivered in time, then uh, the subcontractor and the company can say, well, due to the pandemic, we had problem and so we cannot deliver in time. Um, but that does not apply uh, to uh, revenue loss. And um, actually, uh, I think the, the case for the moment on the short term is really cash management. And the issue is more to deal with uh, the debt and uh, bank uh, payments, uh, trying to manage uh, uh, all that, 
and then uh, of course in a in a second time uh, we will have to uh, address the mid term and long term but it's it's very difficult today, uh, I think, or maybe uh, if somebody around the, the, the webinar has a very uh, interesting uh, forecast, I, they, they will be welcome. But uh, I think the problem is that it's very difficult to forecast the future in the, in the mid and, and long term. And, and this is what will be uh, uh, decisive in uh, terms of uh, contract sustainability, uh, uh, for, for the future. For, so for the moment, we have discussion, of course, with the states and uh, uh, they are aware that the, the situation can be a bit touchy, um, but it's, it's a bit too early uh, to really go deeply into what could be done either, um, as was mentioned for, for Italy, uh, uh, lengthening the contract or, or things like that. So that, that what I can say. Thank you, Olivia. And Ricardo, if I could uh, also ask you to comment on this question, please, relative to uh, projected toll revenues and, um, you know, addressing uh, revenue shortfalls uh, under the concession contracts. Okay, uh, thank you. Well, not being an expert on, on this uh, issue, uh, but from what I know internally and the discussions that I have with other colleagues, what I, I can share is that the private concessionaires already flagged that situation to IMT and to the state, and uh, stating that in, in their in their analysis, a term of first majeure is applied. So this is uh, on the discussion table right now, and well, from the impressions that I am collecting, I think in Portugal uh, there are some reasons to accept uh, that that idea. Uh, of course, a negotiation has to be put up in place. Uh, so I, I can address Patrick uh, when I have some more detailed information uh, or even if we can share some kind of, uh, well, I don't know, a paper, uh, one pager with some information that PR could also uh, share with other countries as a Portuguese uh, situation and how, we, how did we solve it. I think um, in, in many cases it will apply, the loss of revenues. And uh, for sure, uh, a re rebalancing situation uh, in order to renegotiate the, the term of the contract and to delay and to give more extension to the road operator uh, is, is going to happen. I think that's my personal impression. So it's more or less like Olivia say. The state is, is, is on this. The road operator has flagged it. And I think a renegotiation will be, will be set up. And if I have more information or a concrete uh, measure, I can address them to, to Patrick and they, he can share with, with all of us. Um, that's it. Regato, thank you very much. Um, the next question um, will also to go to everybody, but I'm going to start with Mark. And it's uh, relative to um, the frequency and cleaning agents, that, like the chemicals that they are being used, uh, for the cleaning and treatment of the inside of uh, passenger transports and bus stops or rest areas. How, frequ how frequently is it carried out uh, under the COVID-19 uh, situation and what chemical agents are used for this, please? Mark? Thank you. Um, that uh, unfortunately has been left to the individuals. So, um, for the time that um, the public service uh, were handling it, uh, there was all sorts of things going on, including, um, well, the, the natural uh, hand sanitizers, but there were health concerns about how it was being applied, because rather than having a good uh, portion of sanitizer that you could clean your hands with, it was just a small dot being applied. And I think that was uh, some of the thinking behind uh, government's decision to just cut up, cut up, close down uh, public transportation. Because uh, I believe our government has taken uh, a position in a lot of its um, decision making that uh, economies uh, and, uh, and uh, transportation and all these can be restored. It could even take a number of years, but human life cannot be restored. So the short answer is uh, that was never clear because it was left to the individuals uh, until 
uh, public transport was completely shut down. Thank you, Mark. And um, Ricardo, if I could uh, ask you the same question relative, particularly with the rest uh, stops that you have uh, as, uh, you know, freight is moving around. Yes, of course. Well, um, the, 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 the cleaning actions are frequently uh, done. Well, I think uh, depending on the chemicals that, that uh, the companies use, uh, the time to frequently clean again is different. I, I, I noticed uh, uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday in the, in the, in the television, that the, the Portuguese uh, sub subway uh, company has performed a, a very wide and extensive cleaning uh, on, the, on the networks. And I, th I think they mentioned that the product that they use in the common areas, uh, such as stairs and elevators, would last for uh, one month. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I understood correctly. So I think depending on the materials and the chemicals, there are cleaning actions that can be done, uh, well, every month, every week, or some of them have to be done uh, on a daily basis. So depending on that. In terms of the road operators, what I, what I gathered is uh, for instance, in, in the, the vehicles that are uh, driven by uh, several operators, well, they do it wherever the shift is, is, is in the new shift. So it's more or less every four hours, every six hours. So uh, with a, a, a spraying system, uh, all, all obviously, um, well, more is better. And I, I think that... Uh, all of us need to be to be doing this. All public operators in, in Portugal are doing extensive cleaning situations. Well, uh, for instance, a measure is that the passengers only enter to the rear door. Uh, some of them are giving free tickets, so you don't need to show show and buy a, an onboard ticket. You have your monthly subscription uh, in order to avoid the contact. Uh, in taxis, for instance, uh, there was a. a well, a decision to allow and to boost the, the purchase of a, well, a separator, acrylic sep separator between the driver and the passenger in order to avoid the, to have more, co more close con contact. Uh, so I think uh, my, my main concern is that uh, people would start to uh, ease this kind of measures once the, the situation is getting a little bit better. I think that that's my main concern. And my, my address is, and my, my, my opinion is that we should maintain the high level of uh, health uh, and cleaning services uh, along this couple of months. I know it's, it's difficult, it requires a, a good investment, but we have to, to, keep, to keep up the pace now in order to grasp the benefits of the lockdown situation that we all are, all are facing. Uh, in Portugal, we have a, the president made a, an expression is what we gain in April, what we are doing in April, it's to gain our uh, a better quality in May. So we must think that we are on a lockdown today in order to not having a strict lockdown in a couple of months. That is my, that is my advice. Ricardo, thank you very much and thank you for bringing the excellent point of that we need to maintain the consistency and the persistent, be persistent on this. Um, Olivier, may I ask the same question of you, please? Uh, yes, and uh, I will follow up exactly on, the, on this last item. As I mentioned, uh, are we, we need to think today uh, to, the, uh, to what will be necessary in the future and on a long-term basis. So. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, soap or hydroalcoholic solution dispensers uh, will probably be uh, not an option, uh, but uh, generalized. Uh, for the moment, in our case, uh, our aim is to uh, have about six ashes per day, uh, so basically around every four hours. Um, the cleaning tasks uh, can vary. Uh, among time because we have picking, we have uh, waste disposal, and of course we have also uh, shower and uh, toilet cleaning. Um, we managed to get some special solutions against viruses uh, end of last week. Um, 
I, I don't really know the time it can last, but anyway, uh, we will go on a daily, approximately daily or, or one every two days uh, uh, cleaning with that uh, basis. And uh, of course, uh, the situation is a bit different between the rest area where the showers and toilets are not open air, of course, but very close to the open um, open conditions. Uh, when into service stations, the situation is a bit more difficult because uh, showers, for instance, are right inside the, the building. And uh, for that, the, the main question on cleaning is not really the frequency, but how uh, employees are self-protected uh, when they are doing the, the cleaning, which is basically uh, using high pressure water uh, most of the time. So that, that, that will be the, the, the few points uh, I, I could share on, on this. Thank you very much, Olivier. And since I already have you here, I'm going to start with you uh, on the next questions relative to, do you trace cars and trucks by plates, particularly on transnational connections for enforcement and security uh, purposes using an electronic toll system? No, uh, I, I could say maybe unfortunately not, uh, but uh, no. Uh, firstly, uh, as you may know, in Europe, we've got the uh, GDPR, so the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, which intends to look very carefully at what use we can do on data, on personal data. And of course, uh, number plate is considered as a, a personal data. So uh, there have been some efforts uh, to ease enforcement. So for enforcement reason, we can have connection with other concessionaires or even other countries, uh, but that's only for enforcement reason and that's not so easy even. Uh, and in current operation, especially with uh, electronic tolling, um, you, you, well, it's important to have in mind that the, the toll manager, which is for instance, the motorway concessionaire as we are at Land, is in fact in relationship with an electronic toll service provider, uh, which is a service company like a uh, fuel company, for instance, Total uh, in France or DKV in, uh, in Germany or uh, Telepass in, in Italy. And it's this company which is directly in touch with the client. So when we see trucks passing, in fact, we know who is the, its provider, the electronic toll service provider, but we do not know who is the client. Um, it's true that we have a uh, plate number recognition, but this plate number recognition, we only use it internally to check if the plate number of the truck corresponds to the plate number in the tag, uh, simply because we allow special tariff for um, efficiently environmental vehicle, so with the Euro emission classes. Uh, but we are not connected with other concessionaries in France and obviously not connected with other concessionary abroad. So we cannot use a uh, plate number for um, trips analysis as, as the question was uh, asked. Olivia, thank you very much. And, um, you know, as a result of uh, the time we are approaching uh, almost a uh, quarter of uh, um, nine here in the United States and uh, um, there is a really good question that had just come in into the chat um, however because of the nature of the question I we are going to save it and ask it um, in the future so that our panelists are really prepared for this question and for the ones that they haven't seen it is is anyone planning the event for the eventual crisis manager management for a new COVID uh, wave late this year. And I think this is the type of question that requires panelists to give it uh, quite a bit of forethought before they answer. So we are going to save it for a future webinar and ask that question in the future webinar. So um, with that, uh, I would really like to thank all of our panelists and all of our attendees for being here. And I have one last question to Patrick relative to uh, what else is uh, PR planning uh, relative to the COVID-19 response? 
Patrick, if I may turn it over to you, please. Thank you, Christos. So you, you've seen the disclaimer already. I think it's quite self-explanatory. Uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention, attention and for the excellent questions. Uh, again, thank you to our panelists and thank you to you, Christos, for moderating the Q&A. We are planning future PRC webinars, so there will, will be one next week. Uh, actually, just one week from now, and there will be another one two weeks from now, and this one will be focused on freight specifically. So I invite all of you to stay tuned. Uh, we're also planning webinars in French and in Spanish. There's, an, uh, um, there's one in Spanish tomorrow, Thursday, the 23rd, at 4 p.m. Paris time. So if you are interested, please register. And if you don't know how to register, please send a line to info at pr.org. Uh, the summary a summary note of the first four webinars is being published. It will be available from the website today or maybe tomorrow. Uh, and there will be another one, another note of summary. Uh, I think uh, Ricardo suggested it, and I think it is an ex excellent idea. If any one of you wants to share a note uh, about what you do in your country, uh, that's very welcome. Of course, it, came, it comes with the usual disclaimer, but we are very happy to facilitate such uh, sharing of knowledge. And if you have such uh, information, please send us a note at info at pr.org or my direct uh, email address, and we will find a way to include that on PRC's website. We have a dedicated web page, as I'm sure you know by now. Um, these webinars are proving extremely informative and useful. Thank you very much. We're also planning our work uh, more long-term. Christos has just touched upon what we need to do in the recovery phase, or maybe do we need to plan for a second wave uh, of the crisis? Those are questions we'll uh, tackle in future webinars and also in the work of our committees for uh, reports that will probably come sometime next year when we have learned more about the crisis. So thank you everyone for your time, for your attention, uh, for your questions and maybe uh, talk to you next week. And if you want to contribute uh, uh, issues that you're concerned with, or if you want to, to uh, volunteer for a future webinar in which you would speak about your practice in your country, we have two forms here on the screen. Uh, I invite you to check them. And those two links are also available from PIARC's website directly if you go to the webpage that was just on the screen uh, one minute ago. So thank you, everyone. This is the end of our webinar. I think we've been more or less on time and I invite you to join us next week, maybe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christos, and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone, for being here.